Yes, thanks everyone for joining us. And um, as we are waiting for more people to come on the, uh, get on the call, I hope, um, I, I, will, I think I will first have to start with um, wishing everybody a happy new year. And um, irrespective of where you are joining us from, I hope um, your, has already, uh, your year has already started on a very, very positive note. And um, around this time last year, uh, we started our year with um, something that is similar to what we are trying to do today. And, um, and we are really, really glad that we are able to actually pull this off again. And um, I think um, every year, uh, even outside um, the journalism ecosystem, uh, everybody takes stock of what their goals are, their objectives, their careers, their strategies for the new year, and um, such comfort, uh, such uh, conversations and uh, introspections are often really, really important uh, to be able to have a better understanding of what uh, the new year is going to be. And uh, for the journalism ecosystem, for the news industry, uh this is also also similar it's always important for us as an ecosystem to have a better understanding of where we are heading to and uh, to put uh, things into a better perspective and uh, as early as few days into the new year uh, journalists in the united states were already thrown into the full war uh, covering the political drama i think once in over 100 year drama that happened uh, surrounding the election of the new speaker of the house. And uh, while uh, here in the UK, uh, journalists are also covering development and in, uh, incidences around uh, the high cost of living crisis uh, that is meeting in, with a lot of strike actions uh, by several uh, workers across different sectors from transport to healthcare. And um, the consistent, uh, the Ukraine war, uh, the war ongoing in Ukraine uh, is also being daily covered by journalists, while in Africa and several other parts of the world, uh, there are several other crises that continue to be their focus, which sometimes make us not to give attention to the news uh, industry. But we are really glad that um, very in the first week of January, as he usually does, um, Nick Newman, uh, who is joining us today, uh, uh, from the University of Oxford's uh, Reuters Institute for the uh, Study of Journalism, published uh, what has become his annual ritual, um, uh, Journalism, Media and Technology Trend and Prediction Report for 2023. And uh, we are glad that he's joining us today to share insights from this report. And uh, we'll also be discussing how media outlets uh, can continue to innovate uh, for the digital world. Uh, if you don't know, Newman uh, is a senior researcher associate at the Harai SJ, and uh, he has been the lead author of the HANA Digital News Report uh, since 2012. He's also a consultant on digital media and is working actively with news companies on product audience and uh, business strategies for digital transformation. Uh, Newman was a founding member of the BBC News website, uh, leading international coverage as world editor between 1997 to 2001. And as head of uh, product development between 2001 and 2010, uh, during this period, it led uh, digital teams, uh, it developed websites, mobile and interactive uh, TV applications for all BBC journalism sites. So let me start by saying thank you for joining us, uh, Nick, and um, Happy New Year to you. Pleasure. Always... Happy New Year to you, Paul. I, 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 I believe the Institute is already buzzing with a lot of activities already. <laughs> yeah, well, we're halfway through January, of course. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So I would like you to go into the presentation. And um, for our journal, for our participants, uh, we welcome you uh, wherever you are joining us from. Uh, we are always happy to engage with you. And um, if you can use the chat box, uh, to engage with us and let us know where you are joining us from today. Uh, we are going to appreciate it. Uh, we always like to know 
um, we are by are coming now are, are joining us from. So uh, you can start, Nick, and um, I will look at ensuring that people can actually uh, comment using the chat box. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or wherever you are in the world. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk for about uh, half an hour, maybe uh, just a little bit more. Um, so I'm not going to go through the whole report, just going to pick out some of the key trends, including um, findings from uh, an industry survey we did at the end of last year about what industry leaders felt would be um, the key trends in the year ahead. Uh, so what I'm going to show you is, or the data I'm going to show you is mainly from that industry survey and uh, just a little bit of background of who was part of the survey. So it was 303 participants from 53 different countries. So they're actually the widest selection of countries we've ever done. And they're pretty senior people. So uh, editors or executive editors, uh, CEOs, heads of digital, these kind of um, roles. And then about half came from a print background and then the rest either from digital born outlets or from broadcast commercial public service. Um, so um, if we look at the year ahead, uh, 2023, what we find is that industry leaders are a lot less confident than they were this time last year. So less than half, 44%, say that they're confident about their business prospects in the year ahead. And last year, it was about three quarters. So that's a pretty big change. And, uh, you know, a big part of it is this combination of factors. So publishers are finding that traffic to online websites, for example, has slumped a bit, not for all publishers, but for a lot of them. And then you've got rising costs, energy costs or print costs, printers doubled, for example, in many cases, and then declining revenue. So this sort of combination of factors, which is really uh, reducing confidence in the industry. And then a sort of secondary factor, which is interesting, is that the uncertainty in the social media landscape, which we'll talk about in a minute, with um, Facebook getting less interested in news and putting less news into the feed, but also obviously what's happening with Twitter, means that that's all just much more unpredictable as well. So those media companies that depend on traffic from social media are finding that uh, very hard to plan for uh, in this very uncertain environment and partly as a result we've seen uh, already this year pretty much every day we're seeing new announcements about staff layoffs not just in print companies but also broadcast um, which is really starting to be affected now um, so a lot of the sort of business models underpinning cable television in the US or um, commercial commercial television are also affected by the the softening of advertising and then Again, uh, local publishers, particularly uh, under strain. So Reach, which is the biggest in the UK regional publisher, making just announcing a few days ago, they're announcing 200 redundancies. So um, what does that look like? So, so clearly some cost cutting and consolidation. Even publishers that say they're confident about the year ahead are, are talking about trying to cut costs in different ways. So not necessarily laying off staff, but hiring freezes or, or other ways to cut costs. And we would expect more print organizations, given the rising cost of newsprint, to stop publishing uh, seven days a week. I think we've already seen that actually in um, in some newspapers um, in London, for example, some of the free sheets have stopped publishing on a Friday, for example, or closing print editions already. Uh, we're also going to see this year, I think, broadcasters really talking about um, different kinds of strategies. Um, so no longer being able to rely on those sort of big audiences coming to live television and thinking about how they can develop subscription offers or talking about the era when they may have to close their broadcast output altogether. Uh, so I think that's going to be a real, real theme. And then uh, on the subscription side, uh, I think we'll see a lot of media companies um, trying to cut the price uh, or offering special offers. So there's real, real concern about you know whether subscription uh, revenue may um, continue to grow. And uh, so one of the trends that we're seeing, you can see this Washington Post example, 75% off and you get a bonus subscription to share. And that's particularly heavy discounting in the US, but elsewhere too. Having said that, not everyone is pessimistic. Not everyone is pessimistic about subscriptions. 
So actually, most publishers still think subscription revenue is going to continue to rise. Now, this is quite surprising to me because um, in other areas, we know that um, people are looking at their spending across the piece. And so they're cutting second television subscriptions, for example, streaming subscriptions. Uh, and they're also, um, you know, people are worried about the rate of growth and subscriptions slowing down. On the other hand, some of the people we talked to felt that news was going to be different uh, and that people would continue to subscribe because when tough times, uh, people feel that it's important to have better quality information. So we will see. But I think subscriptions is, is definitely going to slow down this year, uh, even if growth is may not stop altogether. I think another sort of interesting theme this year is um, is bundling of of content so as publishers try to provide stop people leaving i think they'll try and bundle in more value in different ways so that may be you get subscriber only newsletters along with your web subscription or it may be you get paid podcasts that are exclusive to providers and then you have publications like the new york times which is trying to bundle different kinds of products. So putting news together with games like Wordle or cooking or passion subscriptions like the athlete, Athletic and offering an all access bundle. And part of the thinking behind that is if you are subscribing and using more parts, not just news, but other things as well, then you're going to pay more over time and you're less likely to cancel as well. So that's the kind of idea behind bundling we see it in the us we also see it in smaller european countries where you have for example shipstead in um in in sweden and norway you have a lot of different titles and they're sort of bundling them together so instead of just subscribing to one publication you're subscribing to a whole load of publications and also podcasts so they bought a podcast provider called podme and they're putting that in the bundle the all access bundle something to watch this year uh, another really key theme which came out of the survey uh, was around a subject that we raised in our digital news report in June, which is really about the extent to which people are avoiding news or becoming disconnected with news, different groups getting disconnected with news, declining attention. And overall, uh, about three quarters of the publishers we spoke to said they were really worried about this trend. And here's you know some, some news editors talking about you could call it news avoidance, you could call it news fatigue, but what people are seeing in their traffic levels is either flat or falling. And this difficulty of getting attention that just becomes harder and harder to get and keep people's attention. Uh, secondly, um, so here's somebody from, from, the, from the Netherlands saying that traffic um, just, just decreased and they couldn't work out why, and maybe they're thinking this is to do with news avoidance as well so publishers are worried about this the question is what are you going to do about it and how can you you know what, what strategies can you take to avoid people or to engage people more actively so we gave uh, our respondents a list of things that um and we asked them which ones they think are more important this year and which ones they're going to be focusing on and what we see is um near universal acceptance that the news that we create needs to be um more useful and we need to help explain the news better it needs to be more accessible so that's things like explanatory journalism q a formats these kind of things which i think have become standards since covid uh, and even before and they really work well with younger people they work with older people next you have solutions or constructive journalism which i think is really picking up um, a lot of interest so 73 percent said that, that this is going to be important to them this year as they counter news avoidance and fatigue and what that means is not just pointing out problems, but the journalist's role is also to give people a sense of what people might do next or offering them uh, solutions, uh, uh, you know, what they're showing how something has been solved in one part of the world that could be applied to another part of the world. Inspirational stories, um, uh, a little bit less so, and positive stories. So around half think that that's a good idea and about half think it may not be a good idea. So there's always this debate in newsrooms which is that um, uh, journalism is not about telling positive news. Journalism is about, is about uh, telling the difficult stories. And of course, the truth is it's about both and it's about how you combine these things. So a bit more skepticism about these, these approaches. I think we're also seeing, and we will see this year, 
uh, some more initiatives to try and um, to tell stories at a more local level in a scalable and meaningful way. And so there's this sort of notion of, of human journalism that puts uh, the impact of policies on people's lives right at the center of things and shows people solving problems and and, and actually as agents for change rather than just sort of passively um, responding to you know big things like climate change. And so there's this human journalism network that started out in Latin America last year in six countries, a trial, and they're expanding that out from Spanish into English and, and more countries as well. So I think that's a sort of initiative that we'll see more of this year. And then uh, a few other things that people have talked about. Uh, so Pink News in the UK um, gives you a little control button uh, where you can basically tick a box and only see uplifting stories, stories that protect your mental health from, from all those negative stories. I'm not saying this is a good idea, but in some areas, these are things that people might do. I mean, maybe when it comes to notifications, giving people that kind of user control uh, might be uh, might be a sensible response. And then, uh, yeah, we're seeing more media like podcasts or newsletters that are really trying to take an optimistic view or constructive or solution space view, like the Optimist Daily. Uh, related to that, of course, is the issue of climate change. And climate change is one of those stories where typically the media has covered it as quite an isolated way. So here's an extreme weather event. Here's another extreme weather event. It's not been very good at joining the dots. And uh, it's also taken a very negative narrative that, you know, the end of the world is nigh, the ice caps are melting, the forests are burning. And uh, I think um, one of the one of the sort of changes is that media companies this year are thinking about this in a much more holistic way. So we, so they're all. I, I think we'll see a step change this year in the investment in climate coverage, but also in trying to think about different ways of engaging rather than purely that doom scrolling approach. Um, overall, we find that thirty percent have developed already developed a climate strategy, and by that I mean not just investing more staff or setting up a climate desk, though people are doing that, but also having um, a training program across the newsroom to train non-climate journalists in into how in, to incorporate uh, the climate angle into business news or sports news, for example. Uh, and then also sustainability and carbon footprint goals around the coverage itself so that it is much more uh, holistic um, and the companies are practicing what they preach as well so I think that's kind of really interesting and, and just you know one example of what that means in practice this is from the Washington Post they have uh, tripled their climate team to 30 or then the, in the process of doing so they've set up a, a section which uses data and graphics to visually explain what's happening the impact of global warming uh, they're doing more green consumerism. So what is the impact on my life? What can I do to, uh, in a small way, to help counter climate change? Green consumer guides, uh, solutions, inspirational stories, podcasts, newsletters. So it's kind of a package of things. Uh, and I think we'll see a lot more media companies doing this kind of thing. It's not just journalism that's in difficulty uh big tech has also had a very very difficult year a lot of layoffs of course um facebook lost two-thirds of its market value last year partly due to you know some of the pressures on advertising but also because people simply don't believe in that vision of the metaverse or most people don't believe in in their version of the metaverse you've got turmoil in twitter you've got um you know this year's iphone looking exactly the same as last year's iphone it's almost as if silicon valley is running out of ideas and we're um is having a bit of a crisis of identity. And I think that sort of tipping point is going to be really interesting to see what the implications of that are. On the social media side, Facebook also has an audience challenge. So it's got a business challenge in terms of advertising, but it's also got an audience problem, particularly acute with younger people. So this is essentially, this is data from our digital news report. So it's audience data. And it basically looks at the percentage of under 25s across 46 countries and what social networks they're using weekly. And what you see is that decline in Facebook from 75% to 58% and that rapid rise in TikTok. So if those trends continue, it's likely that TikTok will overtake Facebook with that younger demographic. And that's important because what the implications are is Facebook are looking at how they can refocus their strategy on uh, 
away from news. So they've cut a lot of the journalism staff, for example, and to focus on the TikTok challenge head on. So how can they put more money into creators and influencers uh, and attract them and that kind of engagement and do less with news? So news is going to be less of priority because of that threat of TikTok, which is interesting. We asked publishers um, where they're planning to put more effort, where they're planning to put less effort this year. And broadly, what we see is a very substantial increase in effort in TikTok specifically because of that growth, because of the younger audiences. Uh, so plus 63 is the percentage of publishers who say they're going to put more effort. And then we took away publishers who say they're going to put less effort to give a net score. Uh, and that's way higher than last year. So last year, TikTok was in the middle of that of that list. This year, it's right at the top. And at the other end, you've got um, people say they're going to put less effort into Facebook, less effort into TikTok, into tw Twitter, sorry. Uh, so sort of significant change there. I think that that graph tells you a lot about the shift that we're seeing in terms of momentum, in terms of the type of content and the type of networks. Um, we did a um, separate report in December where we looked at uh, who was going on TikTok and who was not going on TikTok and why. And we've seen this huge change where, you know, only a very small percentage of publishers were on TikTok at the beginning of last year. That's changed. We now find half of publishers are on TikTok and in some countries up to 90 percent uh, in Western Europe, in parts of Asia, in, um, in, in America and starting to see big growth in Africa, too. Uh, but in other countries, you know, it's still it's still quite low. And, you know, the reasons people give for not being on TikTok are concerns about China um, and uh, concerns about the fact that there's no monetization. There's very little advertising revenue uh, from TikTok, if if not any advertising revenue from TikTok so far. So TikTok is going to be a big story um, for lots of different reasons. And then, of course, Twitter and Elon Musk. I mean, this is the year when... Uh, the media is going to have to decide what it's going to do. Uh, so most journalists, a lot of journalists have said, well, I'm going to leave Twitter, but actually few of them have done so. And the reason is that it's really hard. It is so much, so entrenched into journalist workflows. Twitter is the sort of clearinghouse for news. It's the place where you can, you know, make your contacts and, 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 um, uh, you know, get deep into your beat subjects or whatever it is. So it's really hard to replace but obviously, people are also concerned ethically about what uh, Elon Musk is doing, banning journalists and all the rest of it. Um, so, you know, if you put all that together, um, we asked our sample of executives, you know, if Twitter disappeared, would it be good or bad for journalism? And over half of them say it would be bad for journalism. Um, and part of that is that, of course, in many independent countries, in many countries where there's a lack of an independent media, Twitter remains a really important space for uh, free speech and to reach audiences uh, that don't have another source of information or rely on government sources. So it's incredibly important uh, democratically, always has been actually in, in many of those countries. Um, on the other hand, people argue that it might be good for journalism because we waste too much time on Twitter and we're talking to a, a self-appointed elite and we should really talk to, to to people where they are and to different kinds of audiences. Uh, so here's an editor of a newspaper in Sweden saying, I will actually miss it personally, but I think it could strengthen journalism if we spent less time, if we wasted less time on Twitter. Where would people go if Twitter closed down? So a question we asked and, and really clear answer. Uh, people, if there was no Twitter and you had to develop your networks and post and promote your work. Um, most people don't see many good options, but LinkedIn is number one, 42%, um, you know, small numbers for Mastodon, but of course, everyone's, you know, a lot of people are already on LinkedIn. It has a very good functionality and it's putting a lot more effort into news and has been putting more effort into news recently. And then people are also watching some of these emerging networks. So um, of those emerging networks, I think post is very interesting. Uh, it's obviously going to take a long time to build. But it has a real emphasis on trying to do things differently and trying to build civil conversations. So, you know, not falling into the traps that many social networks have done in the past. And it's also got some kind of ideas about how it might incorporate incentives for paid news content as well. So I think it's interesting to watch, though, of course, it's not going to displace Twitter this year. And for many people in our survey, there is no replacement for the old Twitter. 
uh, you know, there's general consensus that Mastodon is actually just too difficult. Um, so very interesting space to see how those platforms change this year. Uh, so if we look at um, innovation, which Paul mentioned at the beginning, you know, innovation in formats, innovation in journalism, uh, and new product innovation, what can we expect this year? So we asked publishers where they would be putting more effort. And um, the answer is uh, podcasts and email newsletters, which is hardly innovation. <laughs> these these things have been around for a long time. But uh, publishers are finding they're, you know, at a time when it's really key to build relationships and to build deeper relationships with people that both podcasts and email newsletters are really good at doing that so you know you can you can build that deeper connection in audio but also with newsletters which are often hosted and have this real sense of personality i think one of the differences with podcasts this year is people are thinking of podcasts not just as giving it away not just as free advertising free for advertising but also paid podcasts. So, and same with newsletters actually, and bundling that in, as I mentioned earlier, with with subscription packages. So, I think we'll see in the business side a lot of um, a lot of developments in paid, both for newsletters and podcasts. Then we have digital video. So, this is where I think we get a lot of the innovation. So, publishers are looking at what's happening in TikTok from a story innovation point of view as well. So, not necessarily saying we need to be on TikTok, but saying we want to take some of those that amazing creativity in storytelling and the different way of thinking about how to construct a video and bringing some of those ideas into what we do so i think that's something to watch this year meanwhile interest in doing innovations around the metaverse have gone down uh from i think it was about nine percent last year to five percent and i think that's really about people focusing on uh, when money's tight, you just focus on the things that are going to deliver today. You you don't have the luxury of thinking uh, ahead too much. I think one interesting development to watch this year in terms of audio is uh, red stories. So this has been something that's been going on um, uh, mainly automated. So on many websites now and apps, you'll see a text story and you can click on a button and you can get it read to you. Um, the New York Times who are, who are going to be launching their beat, their their app their audio app they're investing a lot of money in uh they're going to be upgrading this idea of reporter reads so the person who's reported it and written the text story is going to read it to you but they also give you a little bio of themselves so you're getting you, at the beginning you, you start to get to know the reporter and they're also putting sound design in it a little bit like podcasts have so it becomes a much more compelling listen so that takes quite a bit of production um but they're betting on that on the other end, you've got automated AI systems that can clone, you know, any of your your voices uh, and then can basically read them in, in much more accurate and brand sensitive ways. So I think that's going to be interesting to see how this battle between human read audio and artificial intelligence audio, which is getting better every year. So um, the final thing I wanted to talk about is uh, artificial intelligence and the um, the sort of next wave of innovation, if you like. So I guess we can think of the internet and um, the changes it's brought in three ways. So firstly, you've had a sort of period where publishers and journalists went onto the internet. So they published websites and um, it was quite a one-way process. Then you had the whole sort of Web 2 revolution, which was based on the idea of interaction and the two-way and anyone can publish and social media and the combination of social and mobile really have been the disruptors of the last 10 years. And the question is, uh, you know, as, as, as mobile slow down, as that innovation slows down and people turn away from social networks, open social networks, what's next? And, you know, Mark Zuckerberg thinks it might be the metaverse. I think, you know, the message from, from talking to, um, to publishers this year is that you know they're not interested in the metaverse um, but they are absolutely focused on these incredibly rapid advances that we've seen in artificial intelligence and in particular chat gpt uh, which came out probably 50 days ago i mean not very long ago at all and people are you know both wowed but also incredibly worried about what the implications of this are so if you haven't seen it what it what it does is it can do all kinds of things you ask it questions and it gives you an answer so can you summarize the challenges facing local news in 50 words 
this is pretty good. I mean, it's a pretty good summary of the challenges. It's not 50 words, by the way. It, it's got that wrong, but it will get better. Um, and uh, there are many, many examples. It's not just text. You can you can prompt it to uh, give you a picture. And of course, many digital output is, in, is incorporating now uh, AI generated pictures as cover art. So the cover art for our predictions report this year was created using one of these gener so-called generative AI tools called Midjourney. So you put in some a prompt, web journalist in a sunset newsroom in the style of Pascal Campion, who's a fantastic illustrator. And uh, it comes out with this, which is really nice, and it's free. So loads of implications here about copyright, about, um, about jobs in newsrooms, um, and about how generative AI is going to be used. You can create video in the same way. So it's not just text. It's not just images. It's video increasingly created by artificial intelligence, not just making things more efficient, but making something new out of remixing old things. Uh, another example. So the um, economist is using Midjourney. Uh, this is a cover they did actually last June to create um, the artwork for, for its uh, famous covers. Um, and uh, in other cases, they're just using Midjourney as prompts to generate their creativity of the humans. So it's not necessarily about the AI uh, cutting out jobs. It's maybe about making us more creative by giving us stimulus and new ideas. So I think this idea of augment, augmented um, artificial intelligence or assisted artificial intelligence is something people are talking about a lot this year. Here's another example. So this is using generative AI for video. So Semaphore, which is the American startup, um, has created a whole series called Witness, which are based on um, interviews they've done with survivors in Ukraine, in the Ukraine war. And because they haven't had correspondents who've gone there shooting footage, they basically create the footage out of artificial intelligence and word prompts and artists. So they've combined the work of an artist and AI to create this. So you can see bombs and mines. These are the um, these are the prompts. There was a car here, and then the car appears or disappears. Um, now you know we can talk about whether this is a good idea or not, but it's uh, a really interesting and creative way of illustrating and bringing to life something. Um, but obviously, all these tools can also be used for um, for negative purposes, and we've seen artificial learning um, being used, for example, to create um, uh, to get Vladimir Zelensky to Vladimir Zelensky to say. Uh, Ukrainians, you need to lay down your arms, which is obviously a fake video. But um, again, that was using AI to uh, to create that. So for for good and for ill. This week, there's been controversy around uh, CNET, uh, who apparently have been using this to create explainers for uh, several months. But there's a whole question about how transparent they've been and whether they've been sufficiently transparent. They say at the bottom, this article was assisted by an AI engine and reviewed fact check by editorial staff. But the idea is that you can create a sort of Q&A explainer much more quickly. Well, basically, you can just put a few prompts into a GPT chat, chat GPT, and you will come out with an explainer, which can then be checked. So you can do more of them. So one of the implications of this is we're just going to be overwhelmed with automated content, and it's going to be harder and harder to tell the difference between what's being journalistically produced and what isn't, which could make trust even more problematic. So lots and lots of opportunities, but lots of challenges as well. Here's another example. This is uh, the Newsroom, which is a new app, which is currently in beta. It's a startup. And every single story, there's a, there's a, they do about five or six stories a day, and it's all based on AI summarization. So uh, essentially, it's looking through a database of thousands of stories. It's choosing the ones that have the most traction and then it's doing automatic summarization. It's pulling out the pictures automatically, and then a journalist will review them. So this is essentially written or rewritten by artificial intelligence, and it also brings out timelines. Um, so again, a really interesting startup that's using AI and trying to do something that is 
of high quality and of real use to users. Very interesting experiment. Beyond that, we asked publishers, uh, you know, are you getting on board with AI? To what extent are you using it? And we find that for different, you know, range of different purposes, they're using it extensively. 67% say they're using it for recommendations, either as a core part of what they do now or just to experiment to see what might be possible. So many of the home pages you go to now are personalized and that they're using artificial intelligence to do that. You have um, uh, AI translation technologies, tools that allow you to move content from one language to another very, very easily to create whole new language services. So uh, this is the Finnish public broadcaster that created a Ukrainian service for a small number of Ukrainian refugees in Finland. And they translated the the, the Finnish stories into Ukrainian um, at very, very low cost. And then um, you have now transcription services are really, really common uh, and really, really useful for journalists to, you know, you've done an interview and you want to get transcribed within seconds, it comes out and it's a very high quality. It hasn't worked within very with with a lot of languages, uh, smaller languages until recently. Um, but there's a startup in in a media startup in Denmark called Zetland, which offers a free service called Good Tape uh, in a multitude of small languages, and it works really well. So they're testing that out um, as an example of how media is thinking about it. So just two thoughts to finish with: uh, what what does all this add up to? What does it all mean? So I think uh, a couple of things. So firstly, I think this AI revolution, automation revolution, whatever you want to call it, is is going to really uh, force us to rethink journalism jobs and to help us think about currently journalists do a load of things. Some of them are journalism, some of them are processing, some of them are technology. And AI is going to automate a number of those tasks. So if, if you imagine things like sub-editing, uh, the chat GPT can sub edit um, something much quicker and much more accurately than a human if you give it the right inputs. So um, maybe the sub editors of the future will be people who are, who are managing the AI prompts rather than doing the sub editing. And maybe that's not bad for journalism. Maybe that will improve the quality and allow that resource to be used to find things out or to analyze things, to do things that the computers can't do. So, ChatGPT is great at analyzing everything we know up to this point, uh, but it doesn't know what's not what's just about to happen. That's what journalists do: cover what what what's just about to happen and put it in context. Maybe it can help with the context. So I think it needs you know we need to to rethink that and uh, to compete with that automated wave of content. We need to make our journalism more human, more distinctive, more trusted. That's the heart of it, uh, and. And that has to be the strategy, I think, for pretty much every media company. Uh, and then I think the second problem is the format challenge. So we're, we went to this period of, of centralization where you had, um, you know, Facebook dominating, the, you know, everyone used Facebook or everyone used Twitter or everyone used Google. And I think we're now in an era of sort of fragmentation where people are using so many different networks. You know, I can't keep up with the number of messaging I get on different networks at the moment. I'm sure it's the same for you. And uh, so the challenge is, how do you create some content and then feed it out in many, many different formats and all these different networks? How do you respond to that format challenge? And, um, you know, broadly, I think that's about stopping talking about, you know, digital transformation to me as a given that we should, um, you know, we should be, we should all be <laughs> transformed digitally. I think the key question for the next five years is how do we take our digital content and transform that into uh, into into ways that may, are more useful and more valuable to audiences. So that's the second uh, big thought. Uh, so our journals and technology trends and predictions, you can access it from the Reuters Institute website, uh, any good search engine. Uh, it's all available for free. Uh, feel free to uh, download it. And I'm very, very happy to take questions, which I think we're putting in the Q&A, right, Paul? Yes, um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nick, uh, for that session. And um, like Nick rightly said, uh, it's time for the questions, interactive sessions. And um, we appreciate you. If you want to come on live, uh, just raise your hand and I'm going to allow you to talk. I, I, I would really love to take some live questions. So please and please uh, just raise your hand 
and uh, you have the floor. And um, we have a number of questions already, and um, but I would for uh, for Nick to catch some breath. Um, the conversation around uh, chat GPT uh, is also of interest to us, and um, so I just want to plug in that if you if you join us next week, uh, we are going to have to be having uh, a real focus session on chat GPT alone uh next week so please uh so just join us uh to, on this uh for this session and if you want if you want uh information about that i think um you can just uh, register for that session uh right here uh to have all your questions uh answered regarding chat gpt hey hey and uh what have you so so uh, to some of the questions that we already have, um, let's start with uh, Daniel, who would like to go live. So Daniel, um, you, you have the floor. Hi, thank you so much. Um, and big thanks to you, Nick, for this presentation. From the very first day the report came out, uh, I mean, the journalism, and technology trends predictions that you wrote, very detailed. I was very worried. My, my worry is uh, stemming from the fact that in the last five years, I have been a, a digital journalist. Um, up until late last year, I worked with the BBC um, in its first uh, digital language service in Africa. Uh, my concern basically is at the, at the outset of digital journalism, there was a lot of kickbacks, a lot of, oh, it's saturated with um, gutter journalism, it's um, going to be fake news. And then we had a lot of laid back attitude from veterans, um, real, real good hands, who at some point um, had no choice but to join what was then a bandwagon. Um, it is beginning to look like AI is the next thing after digital journalism. Uh, with all the fears that you have pinpointed, you, you made mention of um, deep fakes, porn and all of that with um, AI in your report. And th this was the same fear we had with um, digital uh, journalism about um, um, fake news, about uh, people just making a phone or making jokes out of real issues. But as we can see from your report, more and more people go to social media these days to get their news. And if you, for example, are a journalist and you don't know how to um, digitize your content, then you are laid back. So my, my question basically is, with all the fears that AI comes with, how, how, do, we, how do we strike a balance um, such that we are able to um, outsmart whatever it is that is the is the downside to AI. That's basically my right. question. Yeah, great. It's a great question, Daniel. And um, uh, yeah, I, I I mean, just a bit of history. I was I was part of the launch of BBC News News Online, and people. Well, first of all, people thought it was irrelevant, um, and weren't very interested, and they didn't think it was good. They thought it was going to be a flash in the pan. Uh, but I think, you know, I've seen a lot of the changes over the years and, the, and the, you know, the rise of social media was another one, as I mentioned. And I think with all of this, the key thing, you know, it's in many ways, it's neutral, right? We can use these new tech. We can't stop these new technologies. We've seen this through history, um, but we can use them positively and we can use them negatively. And they often have unintended consequences that we didn't think about. And we went into social media with this sort of utopian vision that it was going to make the, you know, bring down all the, uh, you know, dictators in the world and, and the world would be a happy place, you know, and, and the reality is it's much, much messier than that. And what we need to do is sort of right realistically say, Okay, this gives us an opportunity to stop doing things we don't like doing, like you know, a whole load of stupid technology stuff that that can be automated, and to focus on the opportunities. But I think it's, I mean, you're right, this is a huge change. And I think this is the next big thing. And we're going to need to really engage with it deeply and think about how do we make the best of it and how do we, I think, literacy with people as well. Because you could you could take an optimistic view and say, you know, everything's going to get so bad that actually having a brand that you can trust becomes important again. I can see that happening. Um, but in the process, obviously, a, a lot of a lot of stuff gets trashed. So it's um, 
I, what I hope is that we learn the lessons of, of the social media era uh, and we uh, we don't repeat the same mistakes. Um, and we really sort of try and build those direct relationships. We try and market ourselves better as journalists and we do a better job to provide value. Uh, and I think, and to show that we're human. And I think if we do that, then, and work with the machines to do the other stuff, that's the best way of tackling it. Thanks for your question. Yes. Uh, and um, let me take some questions. If there seems to be a lot of interest in AI. And um, please and please, uh, next week is solely for chat GPT and AI. Uh, so, but I will still take a couple more. Uh, so, um, Someone would like to know if you think AI could contribute or change uh, video journalism. If it'll change video journalism. Yes, will it contribute to or change video journalism? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I showed you that example from Semaphore, um, uh, but other ways in which it's already doing, there are a whole load of tools that um, uh, you can create, I can remember, is it called um, picture, uh, Pictory? So you, what you there's an amazing video I should have played it, but anyway, it's this teenager who um, starts off by saying, "Right, I've just found this amazing way to make loads of money." Uh, so first of all, you come up with a how to you know simple way of explaining something. So how to uh, solve this problem, puts it into ChatGPT, gets some text, write a script for for a YouTube video on how to solve this problem, and then. ChatGPT writes the script. He then takes the script, puts it in Pictory. Pictory puts pictures to it. So basically, it's a tool where you put text in, and it's got uh, the ChatGPT has written the sort of cutaways that it wants to create this video. And then Pictory puts all the video in it. And then it says, go to Synthesia, which creates um, narrative reporter voices, you know, synthesized people, and puts it on top. So basically marries all of these things. And he does it in this one minute TikTok video. It's, it's hilarious, but it, it basically shows you how we're going to be overwhelmed by how to videos created by AI in YouTube and TikTok. So yes, it, it will. But again, again, it's the same answer. You, what you have to do is to uh, create something that's better. Because if you really, really unpick what all that means, it's really bad. It's a really bad how-to video. The video, the video itself doesn't really quite quite fit. It's not the best shots and all the rest of it. So it's about finding that quality, et cetera. Yeah, today I would like to know, is there a chance that AI can contribute to manipulated data and information uh, for journalism? Absolutely. Uh, well, it's not a chance, it's a certainty. Yeah, it will. And and it will be increasingly hard to detect. I mean, if, if you just take, um, um, I mean, one of the one of the things that's being used for at the moment is um, is students doing doing essays at university. So people are just putting in the essay question and write it in the style, make a few mistakes, so the so people don't don't think it's a machine, and then it will come out with it and write it at X number of words, and it comes out with it, and then they just adapt it a bit and send it off. And now, but then there's a whole load of new uh, bots that have been created um, to identify whether it's been created by chat GPT or not. Um, so this battle between those that are trying to police this, often using technology to verify information and those that are trying to undermine it or use um, for, for nefarious purposes to try and undermine uh, institutions or whatever th th this is this is this is just part of the ongoing war that is going on between around disinformation and misinformation uh, and it's the next stage of it and and we need to be vigilant we need to put more resources into it i think it's going to become an absolutely core role of journalists to uh, debunk those things and check those things so Cor would like to know does the combination of increased contextual digital hard tech due to legislation changes and AI generated articles potentially create a perfect storm for disinformation actors? Um, I think they're different things. Um, I think the I'm not quite sure what 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 Cor means by the um, the, the contextual digital ad text, because I mean, I, th I think one of the positive things that's going to happen or is happening because the privacy legislation is on the ad side is you've got um, 
publishers relying less on that sort of snooping on your behavior and then showing you ads that it thinks you might want. So um, I think there's sort of almost automated ads that follow you all over the web. I think that's going to reduce and we're going to be in a world where first party data and trust with, with particular brands becomes more important. So I think that's, that's moving in a slightly different direction, but, um, but, but elsewhere, obviously we've got um, the massive automated content that we're going to see is, uh, is, is clearly a, a major challenge. And the danger is that that, you know, the, the, the volume of that um, outstrips the quality and reliable information. It's not clear which is which if you're in a TikTok feed, for example. And I think that's why the platforms absolutely have responsibility to do something about it. If you search for the Ukraine in TikTok right now, you will get many of the least reliable sources. You won't get, you know, there's no sort of algorithms that say this is a reliable source and you should get the news from the BBC or or whatever. And, and I think that that's, you know, that's obviously a deep flaw currently in how TikTok works, but many of the other social networks too. The next question from Jumana, how do you define proper journalism in digital era? Because stories are becoming shorter, more visual, and on all social media platforms. So what else? So what, how do we upgrade the definition of proper journalism in this era, digital era? Wow, it's a great story. That's a great, great um, question. Um, I mean, I, I suppose there's a certain amount of snobbish which says that proper journalism has to be long. And... Um, you know, I think if you think back to a television news piece, um, when I was doing television, it was about one minute 20. Uh, and sometimes it was 59 seconds. And if we think about how long a TikTok explainer is, it's a minute or it might be 10 minutes. You know, so I, I don't think it's really the length that's the problem. I do think we've got an issue with... Um, attention spans and also formats. I mean, essentially there's a mismatch between what journalists think the right formats are for people and what particularly younger people think they want in terms of formats, tone, accessibility. Um, and there is a view that sort of dumbing down and not using traditional English or long words means it's not proper journalism. Um, and I, I'm not sure that's true. I think we need to, you know, try and work out the right the right way of doing it for different people. I mean, part of that is that different people need different things and digital gives you that opportunity. And AI, of course, will allow you to create different versions of the same story, some of them more accessible, written for younger people, some for older people, and um, and to serve up the right version to the right person. Lots of complications in that, but I think um, on the format side, I think regional journalism isn't a half-hour television documentary. It isn't... It isn't um, you know, a thousand word long read text article. It's a range of formats. It's a great story well told. Next question, uh, Kevin from Philippines. Uh, do you think that social media algorithm will still matter for this year? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, social media, I, I'm not one who believes that the area of social media is, is dead. I think that those, um, you know, I, th I think they're on the decline. We've, we've kind of definitely reached the peak. Um, but they it's still used by huge amounts of people. They take a lot of time. And some of them, like TikTok, um, are growing and taking up more of our time and stopping us, you know, doing other things. So yeah, I think I think the and that and that is using an algorithm that is even more sophisticated in many ways than you know Facebook's algorithm was in terms of giving us more of what we like. Uh so yeah, I think I think algorithms, um, it's such a loaded word, isn't it? It means so many different things. You can have amazing algorithms that that give you lots of variety i think of you know spotify's discover algorithm which is an amazing journey to find new things that i might be excited and interested by or you can think about other ones that send you down a rabbit hole and push you further into um crazy views and the problem is some of the some of those algorithms are the same ones that give you more of what you like um in a positive way so it's really hard the problem to solve Okay, the next question. Uh, lots of questions for you. Let's see how far we can go today. Um, I think this is from Adriana. Uh, would news avoidance 
and the struggle to remain relevant in people's life really changed the nature of news. Uh, let's face it, if it bleeds, it leads. Journalism has been about bringing light into problem, disaster, etc. How media viability gets affected by this tectonic trend of becoming irrelevant for the big chunk of population. So would news become a niche type of content only relevant for a small percentage? Um, yeah, it's a really well thought out question. Um, I think I think we're, we're always going to be interested in the unexpected things that shocking things if it bleeds it leads those things are still part of journalism i think what people are struggling with is the relentless and overwhelming nature of it in a world of media abundance where you know every time you look there's another disaster on top of another disaster i think what that is creating is this sense of doom and not necessarily an accurate reflection of the world how it actually is that actually the way in which journalists select things and the sort of negative lens they put on it is actually colouring other things. And it's not actually an accurate reflection of, of society. So it's really about trying to get the right balance. Now, if you go back 10, 15 years, media was, um, you know, the, the editor of a television programme or a newspaper would put together a package of things of leads and bleeds, yes, but then, you know, some fun stories, some lifestyle stories, some TV stories, and it would all be put together in a package. What's happened in digital is that all of that's kind of got pushed into a feed where it's one bad thing after another. So it's partly a problem of algorithms. It's partly a problem of our times where we're living through really unstable and uncertain times. Uh, and it's partly a problem of journalists um, and their negative lens. And, uh, you know, I think that's that's a that's a huge I think it's a huge challenge as to how, how do you. How do you tell stories in ways that give people hope? I think it's really important, or agency, a sense that they can do something about these things. Next question. Um, we have seen in our region that different people, especially political leaders, blame AI and manipulation of content through digital technology uh, of their real videos slash audios. So um, what is the way forward? Uh, with this uh, development. I think um, it's something that is happening in several other regions to where, because uh, we believe AI technology and digital manipulation technologies are really, really advanced. Uh, politicians uh, could start blaming, accusing journalists of doctoring. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think, um, uh, I think it's part of that growing trend where journalists and politicians are at sort of loggerheads and there's a sort of real lack of um, of trust and a sort of sense that there's agendas, that the, the, the journalist isn't there just to report fairly what's happening, but actually has agendas and is pushing those agendas. In, in most cases, that is just simply not true, but um, politicians find it useful because now they can take their message directly to their supporters through social media and they can make those arguments and people believe them because they are sympathetic to that politician. So it's it's a really, really challenging. Um, it's, it's essentially part of this um, trend where politicians feel it's in their interest to denigrate the media um, and to appeal over the heads of the media to get their messages to in, in individuals. Um, we obviously saw it with Donald Trump. We saw it with Bolsonaro. We see it in many parts of the world, uh, and it's it's um, it's deeply worrying because you know what what the independent journalists do is hold those rich and powerful people to account, and that's that's much harder if you don't have the trust, and you don't have the trust because the politicians are undermining the trust by telling stories and telling stories that aren't true, and that's uh, that. So what can you what, what can be done about it? I mean, I think you just journalists have to fight together. You know, that's about um, making the case, not just individually, not just as a single company, but together, uh, and to um, and to demonstrate transparently that the journalism that that you do is open, is transparent, that you correct mistakes when there are, and you're fighting for truth, justice, and ordinary people. You know. 
Okay, and um, we have uh, we still, so we'll go back to TikTok now. I think uh, we have some really we have some really interesting questions uh, from TikTok, and um, like I said, if you think you can, I still want to take one more question live from our audience. Uh, so, um, but let me take these two questions. You know, I'm trying to save um, by time while I set it all up. Okay, I think. We are, doing, we are doing two questions at a time now on TikTok. Come on, load. Don't do this to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So two questions. The first question from Clay, uh, Amazon Forex in Brazil. Um, how to make news uh, interesting on TikTok beyond video? Uh, description text need uh, special attention. Uh, why Maria is also asking a similar TikTok related question. So do you have an idea uh, of content making this use change uh, that is driving people towards uh, TikTok? So how to, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts uh, regarding what people find about interesting about TikTok and um, what ideas of content development uh, do you have uh, that could be relevant to our audience? Um, I mean, I, I don't make uh, content for, for TikTok, but I think um, TikTok fundamentally is about is about videos or visual content. Um, so uh, when I did a report on this in December and we published it, uh, there's various tips in that you can look at. It's free on our website about what makes successful videos. So strong video, strong visuals. You have to, unlike many other social networks, you have to grab people's attention in the first three seconds. Uh, so, you know, people talk about grabbing attention in a YouTube video or Facebook video in the first five seconds. You don't have that long in, in TikTok because people are swiping up really quickly. So if you don't get that connection really quickly, um, that's very difficult. I think be authentic, uh, understand how the algorithm works, that you have to create content that resonates with people. So they're going to react to it um, because that's part of what feeds the algorithm. Um, uh, and be um, be creative. I think you know. Look at how other people are doing it. There's amazing best practice examples, um, and a lot of it is very low tech. It's quite it's quite easy and cheap to make. You know, there's a, there's some great examples of some news creators who just talk into a camera with with you know put silly animations of a of a picture up every so often. <laughs> Um, it really doesn't have to be high tech if you have a message that pe people want to hear. And then there are others where people just kind of draw maps of things. You don't need a, a graphic artist. You can use drawing and stuff. This is all part of the language of TikTok. So this is why it's really different and creative and interesting, I think. Um, have I answered both questions? Yeah, we have Javid on the line now. Javid, you have the floor. Uh, all right, can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Hi, it's Javed Rahman from Pakistan. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Yeah, uh, I'm a journalist uh, here in uh, Federal Capital. My question is related to social media. Uh, social media has no editorial policy. And, but sometime uh, from Twitter, we see we make big news from the social media. But I don't think so. Uh, how we will be able to make it uh, uh, to accept it formally, uh, accept social media formally in journalism? How do you think? Um, what are your views on it? I, th I think there's, there's you, social media is such a, a broad term. So you really need to think about the different journalistic roles and how social media fits in. So firstly, when you're gathering news, uh, you know, traditionally you would go out and talk to sources um, uh, to do interviews with people uh, increasingly and contact people, right? And, and, uh, and Twitter or social media is just now a great way of contacting people. Often it's just a more convenient way to find real people. Now, to me, that's just journalism. It's the same thing. You're just using different ways of of, of, of keeping in touch with people or people being able to contact you. So, so Twitter has become in many countries, you know, the, in, in other countries, it is Facebook, but in, in, in many countries, it's Twitter is the key tool which journalists use to do that. If you want to do a case study, for example, of, um, 
uh, you know, of, of some particular issue around uh, climate change in Pakistan, for example, you can ask a question on social media and find a great case study or a real person to talk to through social media. That's journalism. You're still talking to them and doing the checking at a later stage. So in that sense, I, I just think that debate is over. It's just a brilliant, better way of accessing people. When you talk about it from a consumer point of view, and what they're seeing and how it's regulated and and what how they work out what's true and what isn't true it's it's a minefield it's a really difficult situation some people are really really good at finding their way through it other people get manipulated and it's affecting public debate in a huge way and that's why governments are sort of thinking about how do you regulate that side of things but social media is many things it's absolutely amazing tool but it's also uh, you know a cesspit it's 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 a toxic um, minefield and uh, and our job as journalists is to take out the good bits and work out how to use it effectively and to try and counter disinformation within it as well. So there's lots of different things journalists should be doing in social media. It, it comes down to each company having a clear policy about what social media means to them, how it fits into the journalistic process and what they need to do as a result of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Probably you should, you can take this quick uh, follow up from Lubna. Do you think social media journalism will restrict journalists from getting the 360 view of the story and the story will miss the nuances that are sometimes important when telling the story, the things that Karen said? Sorry, I just missed the beginning of that. Can you repeat it? Okay. Um, do you think social media journalism will restrict journalists from getting the 360 view of the story slash interview and the stories will meet the nuances that are sometimes important while telling the story? This thing, the things that are not said. Right. Um... I think all media has problems, right? I mean, people, to, you know, it's very hard for television news piece in a minute to, to do the nuances. Um, you know, each kind of media has different strengths and weaknesses. Radio is amazing at giving you a sense of the wider picture and connecting you to a place or a person, but it's not necessarily good at taking you taking you somewhere and seeing the visuals. You know, television's amazing at breaking news stories and disasters but doesn't do nuance very well. Social media is not good at, at nuance. It demands, you know, black and white. Um, and But all of these things are, are, are in our armory and we need to understand what the benefits and disbenefits are of each of these media forms and use it and, and correct those as much as we can. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, again, I just say social media is not all good. It's not all bad. It's how we use it. It's a tool. And... Um, and okay. it's here. We, we, you have to deal with it, right? <laughs> okay. Um, we have this question uh, from Diego Rodriguez. Do you have any more examples of how we can make journalism more human? What practices can we adopt and how, how can we apply them considering the rise of hair? Right. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I, I mean, I think... Um... Uh, one of the ways in which we can make journalism more human is um, use our voices and 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 uh, and faces. So obviously, uh, television or radio is more human than uh, words on a page. Um, uh, you connect much more deeply with a podcast than you do with uh, words on a page. Quite often, uh, I think another way you can do it is to. Uh, transparently show what you're doing in the newsroom. So, you know, essentially you're not subscribing to a faceless newspaper, but you're subscribing to a group of people who believe in something and um, check each other's work. And so I think both in how you market what, what it is you do, uh, talking about yourself and the value of journalism is going to be much more important, the value of the humans who create the stories. Uh, so you've seen, you know, people like CNN and BBC quite often do this. They do little sort of profiles of correspondence and uh, and what they do around the world and what their jobs are and stuff like that. I think more of that would make it more human as well. I think other ways you can make journalism more human is putting humans at the center of it as well. You know, the victims of stories, inspirational people who are changing the world uh, one small step at a time. Um, so I think there's lots of ways in, in which we can in which we can do that. Um, uh, and obviously do things that. Um, pointing out when the when the machines get it wrong as well, you know there'll be a certain amount of that too. 
Yes, you're right. And um, I just, uh, I'm seeing lots, I'm still seeing some questions on here. And um, uh, Nick is not uh, an AI expert, so I wouldn't want to put him on the spot. Uh, but we have experts uh, uh, that would actually um, be able to answer your extensive questions on chat GPT. We are going to be having a demonstration of how you can use it as a journalist. Uh, we are going to we are going to be seeing stories um, that have been written using chat GPT. Uh, we are also going to be understanding the trend of uh, that chat GPT and everything uh, next week. So please and please, I know some people have registered. If you have not seen this link, that is a link to register to learn everything about chat GPT. And um, so please and please um, just keep your, we're going to take some of the questions on chat GPT that you have today uh, to next week. And uh, when we'll be joined by uh, Jenna Burrell, who is the Director of Research at Data and Society, and Tom Hakers, who is a technology reporter at Sky News. Uh, Tom has written stories using chat GPT. He has actually co-authored the story with chat GPT and um, is actively reporting on these and other related issues. So please and please um, let us make it a day with us. And um, Nick has us, like Nick rightly said, uh, the report uh, is freely available. I know some individuals are asking for uh, the data or uh, or uh, links or uh, asking us to send this report to you. But I'm glad to say that the report is freely, freely, freely available. I'm trying to get a link. Yes, I have the link now. So if you want to see, this is uh, the report is even more extensive than what Nick uh, described today. Some issues were not even raised today. So get used to the link that I just shared uh, to directly access the link, the full report. Uh, you can look at it in different uh, pages and uh, sections and analyze it. And if you still have any additional questions or queries for Nick, I'm more than happy uh, to pass it. It's on and um, so uh, Nick, uh, what are your last thoughts? And uh, let's put uh, a the session and the predictions and the document into uh, a broader perspective. And um, so, how do you see playing out industry playing out in 2023? And um, what are you excited about? And what are you most concerned about? Um, I think it's going to be a pivotal year, um, and I think we'll see a bit of a a bit of a sort of shakeout with um, with media companies. Essentially, we've kind of got so much media. Um, then I think you know some consolidation and layoffs. This is kind of inevitable, really. But I think on the and then on the other side, I think we're seeing this real interesting change with social networks as well. You know, we've we've got very used to you know Google, Facebook, Twitter, these kind of tools as a core part of our lives, and all of that is. You know, we can't be certain about that. That's going to sort of shift a bit this year. And we're going to start to see AI, in fact, disrupting um, organizations like Google. I mean, Google, which is based on putting words in a text box and getting answers back, is disrupted by a chatbot that can do that more efficiently or uh, in multimedia ways. So so I think that sort of disruption to tech is, is fascinating. And then, you know, the real challenge is how do we as journalists adapt to the next stage of, of disruption and change and take the opportunities. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nick, for that. And um, thank you always uh, for always uh, accepting our invitation uh, when we reach out. And um, thanks to not just Nick, uh, everyone at the Royce House Institute for the Study of Journalism, amazing, amazing team and uh, incredible work you guys are doing. I hope to visit someday, uh, probably the next report that is coming out. Uh, I said I would do this in person, this year's report, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> next, next report from this 
it to it. I'll be next year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll glad to I'll gladly do that in person so that we can pour. It will be it will be amazing looking at papers like this, analyzing papers and going through them together. And uh, yeah, hopefully, thank you to everybody at the right side for study of journalism. We appreciate your efforts, your insights, and your contributions. You always help us put the industry into better perspective. So if you would like to, I would en encourage you to be part of our Facebook forum uh, because we share resources, links, and any other tools and anything we think uh, is relevant, uh, we gladly share. So the link I just put up um, is the link to our Facebook forum. It contains thousands of members of uh, journalists. And um, to learn more about this initiative, uh, I encourage you to check out the website for the International Center for Journalists uh, by visiting www.icfj.org. And um, I also to, we, we are always encouraging you um, to also check out uh, uh, tools, opportunities, and resources uh, through the International Journalists Network page uh, on www.igenet.org. Uh, it's always a very good platform to check out new opportunities, new resources on different topical issues. So this video, hopefully, of this session, we've seen, I've seen lots of questions asking for the video of this session. Uh, would be available uh, on ICFJ's uh, YouTube page. So um, in the couple, probably in the next 24 or 48 hours. So we always endeavor to put the videos there. So uh, make sure you uh, you check that out. Let me quickly get uh, the playlist that it's going to appear on. So you can save that if you really want to watch the videos again. Uh, if you want to watch this session again, uh, Please, uh, the the play the video will appear on this uh, on this playlist that I'm trying to get right now. So, so that link, make sure you keep it. Uh, that is a playlist to our videos on YouTube. And uh, if you if you are on the forum on the Facebook forum, immediately the video is available. I'm going to share the video, so I still encourage you to be part of that Facebook page and um, where you can get real time and quick access to information. So thank you, thank you very much for joining us today, and um, do not hesitate to reach out if you want to uh, get your attention to anything. If you want access to Nick, uh, if you want if, uh, additional information, uh, we're always glad to help you in your journalism career. So it's bye from me and enjoy the rest of the day.